not trained in weather. I do not, did not do a meteorology class. I'm just a nerd whose father, growing up, I don't know if I was scared of storms when I was little or what, but he's kind of the, the ultimate nerd. And I try to not be, but I am because I was raised by him. So he would always teach us about the weather. Like, I vividly remember being like four, five, six, probably, like him talking about all kinds of storm development, cold fronts, warm fronts, all the things. So I learned from him, and I'm going to sound like an old um, grumpy person for a little while, but kids do not pay attention in today's world unless it's this. And I'll ask, say like, oh guys, it's going to rain today or something, or make sure your animals are put up because it's going to, and they go to the, the little app on here and look at the thing and they say, no, it's sunny. I'm like, yes, currently it's sunny, but if you watch the weather, it's going to rain and they can't, they cannot get there. And so I think it's important to teach them to pay attention. I think it's important to teach them some things they need to know and living in Oklahoma you better know how to pay attention to the weather that's my disclaimer but I don't have textbooks really because I teach this in Ag 2 and I could buy textbooks I think if I just went to my administration and was like hey I need some textbooks but like I don't know that I want to invest the money in the textbooks around here I guess that sounds conceited I shouldn't say that it's recording me but I don't know that I do that, so I've kind of just made up everything I teach in Act 2, and my advantage is I only have them for a semester because we're block, so I only have to make up six months worth of stuff, not a full year. If it was a full year, I would be bogged down forever, but this takes me a while. I can make it last a while, which they don't like, but I do. Um, and still water. I have people think like, oh, they're urban kids or, oh, you've got some really great farm kids. And like both of those are true. I have like the cityest of the city, the poorest of the poor and very strong ad kids. So like I have a very big hodgepodge and the weather can tie to everybody and it ties to ag in a fun way that they have not thought of. Right. Like who wakes up and thinks agriculture and thinks about tornadoes? Nobody but it's a tie to agriculture that absolutely exists, if that makes sense. So, and then I nerd out, because I think it's fun. And then it's easy to get them excited when you're excited. Okay, so I'm just gonna go step by step, and I don't know if you go to church, but sometimes the preacher will be like, we're gonna flip through the Bible today, and back and forth, and back and forth, and everyone's like, no. Well, we're gonna do that today. I'm gonna flip you between the regular PowerPoint that I use, and then my how I do it PowerPoint, if that makes sense. So, obviously, any good teacher knows you have to introduce the weather, right? Try to link it to them, like make this meaningful and set up that link from the beginning. And I was supposed to grab my Aggie Art foldable that I made last week and I forgot. But the first thing I do, and I'll just show you my slides really quick, is I start, I think videos are fun, honestly, so I play them Twister, like a little clip of Twister, and they've never seen Twister before because it was like made in the 80s, I think, and they don't understand, and it's funny, and then they're like, whoa, I want to watch that. I'm like, oh, I can't show you in school, but yeah, you should go watch it. It's fun. Um, so we talk about this is kind of the link I was talking about why it matters, blah, blah, blah. And then I start by introducing them to the seasons, um, which is super elementary, but they need to know it. And I have them make a foldable. So I just give them a piece of paper. We fold it into four sections. I like crowns. I'm basically an elementary teacher, not really, but kind of. And I tell them to color all four sections, how they associate the seasons. So like my foldable, the summer is red and orange and fire and death, right? Cause it's so hot. The winter is like blue and peaceful. The fall is oranges and yellows. And I don't know, however they want to associate it. Kids are way creative, better than me. Some of them will draw like 
pictures, whatever, I tell them, leave room to take notes, but make this, you know, your seasons. How do you associate the seasons? So we do that, and then we go through and talk about each one. The dates, that's what really throws them off, because who would have ever thought that June 20th is this today, actually, is the start of summer? They don't. They're like, it's hot in May. Yeah, it's hot in May, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we go through the seasons, and that's kind of my first step. Um, and we make that little foldable thing and use it throughout. Um, and then there's random stuff in there that we talk about, meteorologists, the mesonet, kind of get through some terms that they need to know. Um, and usually the foldable, the seasons, and getting through the mesonet, it usually takes me about two class periods. So back to this, there's the seasons through spring. We talk about what is a weather system, how does it move, go through what a meteorologist is. I like talking about the mesonet because that's the direct link to agriculture for me because the mesonet is like the ag, I guess, extension side of it. And they have a lot of agriculture tools on there and we tie in like wheat harvest. My kids are not from Western Oklahoma, but I am. So we can't harvest wheat when it's really wet because we can't store wet grain. Um, and we have to look at the dew points and all that. Cattle comfort monitor. I talked to him about how I just had sheep die in the summer every year because they just can't take it. We can look at, I mean, this this year, the cattle in Kansas, the whole bunch of them died from heat and like, this is tracking that, if that makes sense. So I show them that, show them all the sites. We can look at all the different parts of Oklahoma, what's going on, show them some of the different maps, like the drought, rain, 12 hour rainfall. Talk about how OU and OSU work together as a cooperative to do this, because it is, a, there's mezzanine offices here, but the meteorology comes from OU, so do that and then we talk about how it's taxpayer funded all the fun things so that's basically my first day or two with the weather then i show them we move on to our next topic which is really boring and i hate that i added this in here to be honest so i would say you could honestly change this if you don't like this part of it and i might next year but last year I was like, hmm, what am I gonna do to fill some time? So I thought, oh, I don't ever teach them about the clouds. That's weather. So we started learning about the clouds, which I can't say that I'm in love with. It gets a little boring, but we try. Um, so I try to make it fun. And but since COVID, my teaching partners and I, we really try to like every day, we want them to be doing something besides me just yapping at them. So I try really hard to give them something hands-on every day. I don't do the best at it, but I try. So that's where some of the arts and crafts stuff comes in because like you can only go outside and look at the clouds so much. But so I try to let them do some fun things. But this is also not my most updated. I updated this before I get Academy and it's not updated. So I should have got a different PowerPoint, but oh well. It gets you the picture. The these are both screenshots from like a movie, right? So this one on the left, they always know is Toy Story. We talk about how Toy Story is just the best movie. So nostalgic, blah, 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 blah. And there's a cloud that they don't even think about is a type of a cloud. And there it is. And the one on the left is Hercules. And then when I updated this, which this is not the updated version, I put in a picture of the DreamWorks without it saying DreamWorks because that's clouds too. And I have them write down at the start of class. Like this is usually where I start a day. Everybody get out a sheet of paper. We're gonna play a guessing game. See if you can get all three of these. I'll throw you a Snickers bar if you can. They do that. So usually they get it. I don't know, we're getting to the point where people don't know these movies. These, these are my generation, not theirs. So sometimes I'm playing with fire. They might not get it, but that's okay. Um, and then we talk about going outside or playing the game where you look at the clouds, blah, blah, blah. 
Sometimes I can make things really stretch if I have to, and sometimes I cannot, but we try. Um, the four levels, high, mid, and low, and then I put special clouds in there, which honestly go in a high cloud, low cloud, or middle, mid-level cloud. But like that's where I talked about wall clouds and cigar clouds and those mematis clouds, so some random clouds. But we start with the high-level clouds, and so talk about the different types. I usually have to print myself out of cheat sheet paper because I don't know these off the top of my head. But like clouds are all made up of water vapor at different levels in the atmosphere. They are in different forms of like crystallization and water vapor density. And so how these are made up, obviously the cumulonimbus are the big storm clouds that we think of with severe weather and then so on and so forth. So go through that. Go to our mid-level clouds where they're at in the atmosphere. Like, are they fog? Are some of them with a cold front moving in associated with that? Um, go through the different things. And then go to the low-level clouds and talk about those. Show them the pictures. Get into, like, the puffier the cloud, probably the more dense the water vapor because when they're real wispy and light, it's a lot more, I don't know what the word is. They're more see-through, I guess, or opaque. So we go through the clouds, and then, like I said, I like to have something fun for them to do. So day one and two was the foldable with the seasons coloring. Day two, we've talked about clouds, and then we have an activity. In the past, I've given them all a piece of paper with cotton balls and let them build one of the, how many was that, nine? clouds with the special clouds there's 12 because uh, we talk about wall cloud a uh, cigar cloud and mematis clouds and so there's 12 different types of clouds that we've talked about i give them a piece of paper and cotton balls and they have to get glue and build whatever cloud they want they have to tell me which kind they chose and then define it and they do their little art Last week I taught it to the Agate Academy and we talked about like you play the teacher and I made them come up with some different activities and they are brilliant and smart and way better than me. And so they came up with on your board doing a three tiered like draw line. These are low level, mid level, high level. Give them three sticky notes and they have to pick one out of each of the 12 and go put it where it belongs. So like cumulonimbus you're going to put in the high level. So that I thought would be fun and easy and fast if you didn't have cotton balls and paper. And then one of them, brilliant child, they should have got a gold star times five. They said, bring shaving cream and on the desk, everyone in elementary school loved to play with the shaving cream on the desk. But instead of making whatever fun thing you wanted to make, you have to draw your cloud, whichever one you chose and demonstrate it with the shaving cream, which I thought was kind of fun. And I never would have thought of it. So A++ to the 17 year old that put me to shame. So <laughs> that usually takes about one class period for me. And then here's the picture, I just did this last night, of some of the different clouds. Obviously cumulonimbus over here. I'm not sure what I built here, but one of the kinds. I would have to go look back up at that. I love giving kids arts and crafts, which I know that some of my kids are like, oh my gosh, we have to do this again. I'm like, shh, I could be making you write a 10 page paper. Just do it. But we know this. Just for perspective. Kids all think so differently and are so brilliant. I had one who everyone did it like this, like flat. And I walk over to his cloud cotton ball masterpiece and he's built it up into the atmosphere, a full on like severe thunderstorm and it looks like it and it's going up and out and it was beautiful. I was just, I just kept staring at it. I was like, oh my gosh. And he was not the kid that you would think, but letting him do that with his hands, like he thinks so different than everybody else. It was fun. So I like giving them this cause then I get to talk to them about it, walk around, see him, all the fun things, blah, blah, blah. But I also hate grading papers. That's boring, but I like to look at their arts and crafts and so that's what I choose to do. All right, step three, this is where it gets a little boring, but we have to have content. 
you're not teaching them content, what are you doing with your life, right? So we have to get in and learn this stuff. So actually, while I'm sitting here, I'm going to see if I can pull up. Now I have way too many um, weather and ag slideshows going on here. See if I can find my, up see, yeah, uh, here's my updated one. Wakita. I also love YouTube videos. This is it. I'm not saying that I know what I'm doing. I'm just a nutcase who goes with it. But I found this funny weather video and it's of a weatherman who his computer freaks out and like it says it's 2,500 degrees in Arizona and he just goes with it. So like anytime I can pull in a character lesson with my stuff, FFA is all leadership and so I try to do that. We talk about just going with it. Like the reason he was funny and we all laughed is because he didn't panic and have a bad day and throw his fist down and kids especially coming out of COVID don't have those skills so I try to work that in but we talk through like the content terms they have to know this to figure out where we're going so I go back to that foldable and on the back side we take some notes which is boring but we have to I try to make it fun but they have to know that the jet stream is what's moving all of the currents around the earth it's what brings the weather good bad and different it's what's moving it so we go through that i like looking at pictures we talk about where cold air versus warm air comes from how that influences the pattern of weather um, we talk through low pressure systems and high pressure systems as the next one and how those are both determining specifically what's going to happen right if we have a low pressure moving across the pressure is changing it's a lot more unstable at the ground we're going to have severe weather if we have a high pressure system that's bringing the stability pushing out the unstable air we're going to have nice calm weather and so we have to know that um i show them lots of maps that i don't know anything about but i think are fun <laughs> then we talk about fronts and you can see here i always just always reinforce like here's your low pressure system here's your front look at all the severe weather ahead of it we're smack dab in the middle of that it probably moved from the panhandle all the way across to the eastern side of the state and it's there we have to learn about fronts because fronts are what bring usually the severe weather um, these are really old i love showing them this because they're like what is that i'm like guys you don't remember 1997 but i vividly do you weren't alive but i was and this is what our graphics used to look like. So be thankful for computers. And I like to chase bunny trails, as you can see, it's fun. We talk about more about fronts. Somewhere in here I have dry lines, I don't know where, but basically I really try to reinforce that all severe weather is caused by air movement across the globe, competing air, hot and cold, basically running into each other like two old bulls out in a pasture they're going to hit something's going to happen either one's going to fall over one's going to break their neck they're going to bounce back and hit again whatever happens is the cause of that same thing here with the weather and so in my redneck terms that's what i tell them but some fun graphics like when the frets hit and converge we have a lot of instability in um energy and so it forces it up that's what builds those storm clouds creates severe weather um, we talked through what different storm systems they've seen everyone thinks about tornadoes but we don't think about heat bursts that have been happening in western oklahoma this spring we don't think about um, straight line winds that can cause honestly more damage sometimes than tornadoes we don't think about flooding we don't think about fires in the last six, seven years, I feel like in Oklahoma, we've had way more uptick, especially in Western Oklahoma, in fires that have caused a lot of damage and impacted agriculture. And so we don't think about all that. Um, I like to show them weather reports because they don't watch the weather. I mean, I don't either, I'm guilty of this, but I don't sit at home at 10 o'clock at night and watch the weather. I get my meteorologist i do watch a news station but it's on my phone right like i follow them on social media and they 
are smart. So they've started uploading their um, forecasts and all of that to social media, and that's where I watch it. But kids don't even know to follow them. So I try to emphasize, like, hey, you don't have to watch the weather, but you need to follow a good meteorologist and pay attention. So show them this. We talk about a cold front moving through. There's a time lapse. This is a video of it moving through, I think, like more, and how the, it's sunny day, nice. All of a sudden, you see these dark clouds. It moves over. We can tie that back to the clouds that we learned about yesterday and what type of clouds that it is, blah, blah, blah. Um, continue to talk about some content like you could make this really fun and I just haven't but you could have them make some chocolate chip cookies you know we probably couldn't bake them but like do something like that or make a some recipe and talk about how you have to have these ingredients right if I just give you flour and sugar you don't have anything right but if I give you flour, sugar, butter, and chocolate chips, now we have something, right? Now we're gonna have a product. If I give you chips and some black olives, you don't wanna eat that, right? But if I give you chips and queso, now some black olives and some meat, now we have nachos, right? And so you have to have moisture in the form of humidity, unstable air, as in air masses moving across the globe, and then lift to form severe weather. If we don't have those three, you're not gonna get significant severe weather outbreaks. So this could be really fun. I haven't made it fun yet. I need to do better, but mental note. Uh, we talk about the dry line, that's really important because storms always are forming right ahead of the dry line because that's where we have that interaction of warm and dry or not warm moist and dry air hitting and so i think that little link down there is a video of a weatherman explaining the dry line because if you watch them consistently you're going to learn so much that's what i love about meteorologists they're constantly teaching because they want you to know and people are just too busy or closed off or whatever to pay attention and learn so we talk about that too, like, hey, if y'all listen, you're gonna learn things. So I tend to be a little preachy and I feel bad about that, but my job is to output wonderful human beings or try and I try. Um, and yeah, I show them severe weather reports. We talked about that. Um, step four, we really, from here, dive off into severe weather. And so we've kind of just been doing general weather, but now we're gonna go to the fun stuff. Um, and this could take however many days you really want it to take. Um, we really focus on thunderstorms in general. Everyone knows what a thunderstorm is. We, for me, like everyone has sound machines now or play sounds on their phone when they sleep. Like if I had the choice, my sound machine would be just a thunderstorm. Oh, it's so soothing. I love it so much. Um, we talk through like the difference in just a nice summer thunderstorm that's just fun versus getting your cellar, which would be a storm with a mesocyclone, the formation and structure, all of these different things. I'm sorry that I'm giving you whiplash and keep hopping back and forth, but it is what it is. So here's where we talk about this. So isolated thunderstorm, usually danger, right? These can turn really bad in a hurry. They're gonna turn right, they're gonna start rotating, and that's all associated with a mesocyclone, which I haven't got to yet. And then these lines, um, a quasi-linear convective system, it's a long lined out state. I mean, we have Missouri all the way down, probably this strung all the way down into Texas because it's a long system. It's still air movement, across the globe on a front, but it lines out, can still be majorly severe, but not gonna probably put down an F5 tornado. The one on the left could and might. I also, this is a side note, but kids do not know things they should know. And I will ask them, because if you are a weather person, you have to know towns in Oklahoma and you have to know counties. I think it would be really fun to have them identify as many counties as they know and mine are gonna get pain 
maybe one other one, right? And that's just sad. I'll ask them, how many counties are in Oklahoma? And they just stare at me. One time I got like 140, you know, <laughs> no, right? Or 20, and I'm like, guys. So they don't know there are 77 counties. They probably can't even tell you the ones that butt up to Payne County in my classroom. So I should be better at teaching than that too, but I can only make this, I can't have like a full semester of weather, even though that would be fun. So I gotta kind of go faster than I want to, but maybe it's because I was from a little town. Maybe it's because my dad is an ag teacher. I was always traveling, always paying attention to different towns and where they were at. It was just ingrained in my head. They wouldn't even know that Elmore City is in Oklahoma, have I not told them. So like I tried to pull a lot of this radar is directly from Oklahoma, these screenshots, because they need to know. So that's a side note. But we really identified two differences. Isolated thunderstorms, squall lines, it's the slang term, I guess, but quasi-linear convective systems. <clears throat> then we talk about, okay, with an isolated thunderstorm, you have two types they can be. They can be a supercell, which has got a mesocyclone, and it's got the rotating updraft, and then we explain that it's a tunnel or a vortex of air that goes two to 20 miles up into the atmosphere. Rotating, it can be, or two to 10 miles in diameter. So when they tell you to get in your storm shelter and you're five miles away, well, they have a reason for that. It's because the rotating air can jump around. Yes, normally they can pinpoint it to the exact mile, but not always. We are not the end all be all, like weather can change. It's not us that's controlling it. So we try to predict it the best we can. So talk through the structure, I guess, if you will, of a thunderstorm. Go through this in detail. I like to tell them all the different things, point out the red. We talk a little bit about the cap here because the penetrating top or the overshooting top, if a thunderstorm can't bust through the cap, which is a stable air in the atmosphere, we won't have any major severe weather. But once it does get ready, and so we talk about that, spend a lot of time on this and the structure of the cloud. Show them a real life picture so they can visualize it. I like hop back and forth because this is fun because you get to know all the terms, but then here you can actually see it in real life. There's just another drawing. <clears throat> I try to, I know just enough to be dangerous. So like when I try to throw in terms, sometimes they don't get it, but how the updraft creates the rotation, talk about rising motion, all this. Then at the end of this, I have them do a activity with Play-Doh. Once again, I'm an elementary teacher, I think. And I have them make the structure of the thunderstorm that we just talked about. So this was from the Agate Academy last week. Some of them are brilliant and do great. Some of them need to go in like a fancy French art museum of abstract work because you can hardly see what it is. Um, had I been thinking this day, I would have had them label their parts, but a lot of them got the mesocyclone as it's going up, right? That's these little tubes they all decided to do. Um, you can see tornadoes underneath on some of them. This one has a, the overshooting top and the anvil, the flanking line over here. So they sometimes get it. Sometimes I was also rushing them. I only gave them like 10 minutes to do this. Sometimes in my class, if they're really working hard and trying to do good, I could give them up to 30 minutes. I mean, depends on the type of students that I have at that time. But I let them usually let it dry. And if they want to take it home, they can. Most of them just throw it away in my trash can, but that's okay. We have fun. So that's my fourth activity, maybe. I don't know, something like that. Um, let's see. I should have stayed here. We just continue to talk about storms. Um, so we kind of in, did the theory of like a squall line versus a rotating thunderstorm and I showed them the pictures of it on radar. Radar's fine, but 
we need to see what it looks like in real life. So you're driving down the road and you don't think, oh my gosh, there's a tornado, when in reality, there's nothing to be afraid of, right? So we talk about the difference in a shelf cloud and how that is the leading edge of the squall line. And it probably does have some strong wind, but it's probably not gonna produce a tornado. And then a wall cloud's very isolated, but that is danger, right? If you're next to a wall cloud, you need to get underground and talk through the difference of those. Um, there's more pictures of it, learn the definitions. Here's the picture of it live and the picture of it on radar. There's your wall cloud. There's the picture of it on radar. Talk about how this is the straight view of it, right? We're looking just at the side. Um, the radar is through the top of it. So what you're seeing here, you know, as we call a hook echo, that is the wall cloud. And a lot of them don't realize that and how this part is probably moving this way. And if you're up here, you're not really in danger, even though you're probably tornado warned in Midwest City, Norman is who's in the danger zone. So talk through that. More terms, talk about all kinds of fun stuff, pictures. Then I think this is really fun. I like to show them videos like i said these are different tornadoes that have happened in oklahoma and depending on timing and where we're at and how into this they are once we've kind of gone through all these terms i like to have a day where we just watch tornado coverage and they get a piece of paper and a pencil or pen and i make it a challenge i like to set things up really dramatic kind of a drama queen and i tell them like you know it's a competition, blah, blah, blah. And I always have them write on the back of their paper, like whatever I decide I'm gonna do, like I'm gonna get you a small Sonic drink, or I'm gonna get the winner a candy bar from the gas station if you, after lunch the next day. So right on the back, I make them decide ahead of time what you want. So it can be, if I decide a small Sonic drink, they can have a slush or whatever. If they want a candy bar, whatever. And then I say, all right, turn your paper over. I'm going to play this for basically the hour and you're listening intently and any weather term that we have talked about and there's a lot I mean today we've talked about a lot that I'm just and I'm about like that in class or probably worse just, just random write it down if you hear the meteorologist say it write it down and whoever comes up with can get the most of our weather terminology things we've talked about on your paper gets their prize on the back and so I make it a competition and then they listen and they pay attention because they want their sonic slush with nerds <laughs> so anyway and also just more they don't know where Laverne is so I have to show them that and talk about it and it's really fun I can blow their minds if I know the mascots of the school and I can just start throwing them out and they're like what I'm like guys y'all gotta pay attention better like come on so we play that game, that's pretty fun. Then from there, when we're watching the videos, I try to find them the different ones, right? Like the severe rotating thunderstorms, like the Laverne tornado, that was an isolated thunderstorm. It wasn't a big line. But in 2018, maybe 2017, I don't know, in El Reno, late at night in May, there was a squall line that came through and put down a tornado right by the Diffie Ford and there was a little trailer house parked there and it, people passed away in that because they didn't know, no one knew. Even the weathermen were freaking out because they had no idea. And so we watched that video and talked about how just because they're not predicting a tornado doesn't mean you shouldn't be paying attention um, and go through that. And then, I developed this unit during COVID because I had nothing else to do and I had to teach online and this was fun to teach online in some ways. And so I made some assignments, which I'm not advocating for giving Google Classroom assignments unless you have to, but I made them these and I put it in the folder so whoever gets the folder can have access to it. But they can go through and do this quick little assignment over, you know, is that a bow or hook echo, bow or hook, and then kind of reinforce what we've talked about with the different storm systems. Um, so that's on there. 
let's see. And that's where we kind of get through this. We talk about the radar, look at the different images, go through what it is, teach them. I probably don't let them play the terms game until after this because you're going to hear David Payne screeching about the screaming eagle and all of that on radar. And so I show them that and point it out. And so we usually probably play it about here. This is another thing I added this last year to fill time, but we went through the different types of tornadoes. I'm not saying I'm in love with this section of it, but it did give some just other things to talk about. And then I think it's important to know where we've been and how much things have changed. And so if you watch the 1999 May 3rd coverage, it's wild. And at the, that time, that was good technology. We were cutting edge and they watch it with the big cell phones and they're like, what is that? I'm like, hey, people died, but also a lot of people lived because of their, you know, broadcasting. And so we show that all the different like variations of coverage and then we just watched coverage from Laverne in 2019, which now is outdated, but think about how different the coverage is, how they're not calling in to the news station anymore on a phone. They are, I mean, they are, but you don't see them standing there on a landline talking. Like it's so advanced and continuing to advance and blah, blah, blah. So we do that and they weren't alive for May 3rd and so I was, I vividly remember where I was. I vividly remember being in kindergarten and like freaking out and we were supposed to go to t-ball practice and it got canceled. I didn't know why and sitting on my dad's bed with my mom and we were watching it and like, I don't know. I just tell them stories and they think I'm kooky and a nut and it's fun. Um, this year, there must have been, wasn't Ida a hurricane this year? Yeah. So we must have talked about that. I don't really know. Um, we go into rating the rating of tornadoes because that's important um, some more content knowledge and a lot of them don't know that we rate it on damage like that's how they're rating it and so we watch some uh, and it's cool to me that Oklahoma is kind of the capital of all things storms and severe weather and so all of these experts who are talking on these videos are from Oklahoma and if they're interested in this, I always try to make it a point of like, you can, this can be your job. Like, how fun, right? If I was an act teacher, this would be fun. And I never even thought about it. And so they can. Um, we go through that. Yep. So a lot of things that I, there's a type of tornado's history, blah, blah, blah. I kind of jumped ahead of my own PowerPoint. So that's fun. Um, I haven't done this, but I thought of this last night. If I needed another activity, they love to be destructive so I could partner them up and have one partner, you're going to do this in secret. Like, I'm going to take all the partners A with me, all the partners B, you have a secret task, and have them have, like, popsicle sticks or little wood shards, different things, and make them build a tornado damage site, and then their partner B has to come in and raid it give it a F1, two, three. Like that would be kind of fun if I could pull that off. I haven't thought through all of it, but that could be fun. Or, I don't know, me build the damage site ahead of time, have them all be the tornado raiders. So, I don't know, that could be fun. I just haven't done it yet, but more, more ideas. Um, then I talk extensively about tornado precautions, teaching them pay attention, who to get their updates from, what to do. They all know that for the most part. But like our ag building doesn't have a designated tornado shelter and we're out seven miles from the school by ourselves. And so they always ask like, what do we do? And we talk through that of like, well, we would probably go to the bathrooms and everyone hunker down and blah, blah, blah. And so, and then I get into the agriculture tie um, as much as I can. Let's see. There's just a video on precautions. Talk about, you know, all the different things that the EPA says agriculture happens from natural weather events. We go through in 2013, El Reno was hit by a big F5 tornado that destroyed the OKC West stockyards. And that was one incident where there was $3 million in damage alone to that stockyard. 
and how significant of an impact that had on Oklahoma agriculture. Um, the year I made this, Iowa had had a big flooding event that had 220 million in damage. Drought annually has this much, six to eight billion dollars. And so, you know, agriculture is every day affected by the weather, but then there's some big problems that come from it too. And then this is just a link to the tornado that hit OKC West. Another one, um, in that El Reno tornado on May 31st, 2013, there was like three or four storm chasers that died because the tornado did a loop that they didn't know about. It was so big, that mesocycling cyclone was so wide that it came back on them and sucked up a lot of their vehicles. And so we talk about that and that reinforces that the mesocyclone isn't just one little like, yeah, the tornado might be over here, but if it's a giant mesocyclone, there could be one over here too. Kind of reinforce that. Talk about lightning, because that's the bigger worry. It's not tornadoes, it's lightning, honestly. Cattle getting killed by lightning, that's a big damage. What to do, and then we go into the wildfires because that's been a big problem. Talking about the mesonet, yet again, gives fire conditions what affects it, blah, blah, blah. They like to watch the cedar trees blow up, so I find a video of a cedar tree on fire because they're fun. Then we talk about the Ray Fire. That was in Western Oklahoma in 2018 and how much damage it caused. And like, my parents live here and there were airplanes dropping the fire, whatever, on our land over our house. And so how I can give them kind of like, nothing happened to us, but it was this close and how scary and out of control that can be and like to have your crap together if they're predicting a fire and don't be the person that accidentally causes it. That's a picture of the Ray fire, videos of it. So yeah, and if I was a great teacher, if I would have Val Caster who lives in Oklahoma or in Stillwater come speak to my kids. I think that would be so fun and he could bring his big truck. I need to do that this year. But you know, sometimes you just get busy. But he, I think, would absolutely do it and love it in Northwest Oklahoma, which is not us, but Marty Logan, I think, would love to do that. I'm sure somebody in the East would also, Vaughn Caster maybe, or somebody in that area. Um, also, my emergency management people could come out. That would be fun and talk to them about what their job is in all of this. And they are storm spotters. I mean. They're the people on the ground alerting Stillwater to set off the sirens. And so, and the new Miss Oklahoma this year is a meteorologist for News on Six. And so I'm pretty sure that their job as Miss Oklahoma is to go speak to schools. So as a meteorologist, how fun would it be to have her in her crown liven up my boys and come speak to them about weather? That would be fun. So. Maybe this year I will implement all the cool things I've thought of to tell y'all about that I haven't done myself. So anyway, I don't know. That might be everything I have. Yeah, that's it. But I have this folder. So if I don't know if Emily's going to send it out to everybody or what she wants to do. But if you would like me to share it with you, I would be happy to do that. Oh, I love it.